Hallelujah. So you got a bunch of paper this morning, and I promise I didn't take down half the Amazon to give it to you. But here is, we're going to start the fast on Wednesday. And so the first thing you've got is 21 days of praying the word. This is uh, a four-square publication. It's not mine. But I read through it. I like it. And I thought we'll start with that. And then the last 19 days, I will have something else for you. So that's the fasting. And then you got this. And so may I wish all our wonderful Chinese congregation a happy Lunar New Year. I'm sorry I don't have red envelopes for you today, but uh, we so appreciate that part of our congregation. Now, the weekly message, I can tell you right here and now, it's kind of long, but I want you to read it, especially towards the end. And this was a, an address by the president of Argentina, and it was an amazing address. He, he spoke at Davos, and so I encourage you to read that. And that's about it. And then I will have Rod come and read the scripture for today. We're shaking up things a little bit, and so Rod's going to read the scripture out of Mark chapter 1 for us today. Hello? Right. From Mark chapter 1, 21 to 39. Then they entered Capernaum. When, they, when the Sabbath arrived, Jesus lost no time in getting to the meeting place. He spent the day there teaching. They were surprised at his teaching, so forthright, so confident not quibbling and quoting like the religious scholars. Suddenly, while in the meeting place, he was interrupted by a man who was deeply disturbed and yelling out, what business do you have with us, Jesus? Nazarene, I know you are up to. You're the Holy One of God. You've come to, to destroy us. Jesus shut him up. Quiet, get out of him. The afflicting spirit threw the man into spasms protesting loudly and got out. Everyone there was spellbound, buzzing with curiosity. What's going on here? A new teaching, what, what does it say? He shut up defiling demonic spirits and tells them to get lost. News of this traveled fast and was seen all over Galilee. Directly on leaving the meeting place, they came to Simon and Andrew's house, accompanied by James and John. Simon's mother-in-law was sick in bed, burning up with fever. They told Jesus. He went to her, took her hand, and raised her up. No sooner had the fever left her than she was fixing a dinner for them. That evening, after the sun was down, they brought sick and evil-afflicted people to him. The whole city lined up at his door. He cured their sick bodies and tormented spirits. Because the demons knew his true identity, he didn't let them say a word. While it was still night, way before dawn, he got up and went out to a secluded spot and prayed. Simon and those with him went looking for him. They found him and said, everybody is looking for you. Jesus said, let's go to the rest of the villages so I can preach there also. This is why I've come. He went to their meeting places all throughout Galilee, preaching and throwing out demons. Wonderful. Thank you, Rod. Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that as we look and delve into your word this morning from the book of Mark, you will inspire us and you will encourage us and you will minister to us by your word because we know that the entrance of your word brings light. And so we thank you for that now in Jesus' name. Amen. Don, would you come? Don has a testimony.
Good morning. I can't number the t number of times that God has bailed me out. Even when I've gotten myself into situations that all I can do is cry out to him, he has bailed me out so many times. So that's what this story is about. Um, I've known my best guy friend, Tom, since I was in the beginning of junior high. And we grew up together in youth group at church. Well, when he graduated from high school, he decided to move to Glendale, California and go to guitar school in Hollywood. So off he went and found a roommate down there. And what happened is every so often, his first roommate got married and moved out. And so he called me and said, you want to move down here and be my roommate? And I said, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good. So then he got a second roommate. His second roommate got married and moved out. And he called me and said, you want to move down here and be my roommate? And I said, no. So then he got a third roommate. His third, third roommate got married <laughs> and moved out. And he called me and asked me the same thing. Well, by then, I was in a broken relationship with my girlfriend. I hated my job, and I decided, why not? I'm young, I'm single. So I packed all my belongings in my Toyota Corolla, and I drove down to California. But I had driven down to California before, and if any of you know anything about Driving down on I-5, when you get to Northern California, it's just miles of straight stretch through wasteland, and it's like boring as all get out. So when I moved down to California, I made a conscious choice. When I got to Grants Pass, Oregon, I cut over to the coast, and I went down Highway 1 along the coast, which is totally beautiful. The problem is, I got down, drove through San Francisco, I got all the way down to San Simeon, and it was late on a Sunday evening. And I had intended originally to, when I got to Carmel, to cut over, to cut inland at Carmel so I wouldn't have to drive Big Sur. Big Sur is totally beautiful in the daytime, but at night it just winds like this above the, the cliffs, and you can only drive like 35 miles an hour. So I drove like 100 miles along Big Sur, and it was getting really, really late, and my gas gauge was going down. So I got to San Simeon, where Hearst Castle is, and I finally had a chance to cut inland um, to Paso Robles. So that's what I did. And I got to Paso Robles, and there was an AMPM Arco station. Do you think I stopped to get gas? No. I, I looked at my gauge, and I thought, oh, I got like an eighth to a quarter of a tank left. There's a couple little towns between here and Lost Hills. I, I think I can make it. It's like 63 miles between Paso Robles and Lost Hills. And there is nothing out there except two little dinky towns. And I quickly found out that those two towns close. On Sunday nights, they close up at 7 o'clock. Nothing is open. No stores are open. No gas stations are open. Nothing. So I'm driving along Highway 46 out in the middle of nowhere. There is nothing out there. And my gas gauge is just going like this. And I start praying. And I'm going, Lord, please get me to a gas station. Please, please. And I'm thinking, wow, I wish I would have filled up back at the AM, PM in Paso Robles. Finally, I did run out of gas. In the middle of nowhere, pulled off the side of the highway. I tried to flag. There were hardly any cars out there. It was probably 10 o'clock at night. Um, 
I tried to flag a couple cars down. They just blew right past me. So finally, I decided I'm going to start walking. Eventually, I'll make it to Lost Hills and, you know, get a gas can and walk back to the car. So I start walking. I got just a little ways down the highway, and I was very rather scared and very dejected and felt like an idiot for not filling up in Paso Robles. And I got just a little ways down the highway, and there's this sign that says, Zeke's Unical. It was a Union 76 sign. And I thought, Union 76 out here? And it's pointing down this dirt road through, like, the almond trees or whatever. There's this, like, forest. So I thought, well, Zeke's Unical. So I walked down this, about a mile down this dirt road through the, through the trees, and it wasn't a gas station. It was a Unical refinery out in the middle of nowhere. And there was an office there. And by the time I got out there, it was probably 1130. And I walk into the office, and the guy just about has a heart attack because he didn't hear me coming because I didn't drive. And uh, just about has a heart attack when I walk in. And I say, I ran out of gas on the highway, and, you know, can you help me out? And he looks at me, and he says, you know something? I got a little pickup, pickup truck, and I keep a two-gallon gas can in it. And normally, I don't keep any gas in the gas can. But something made me stop on the way to work this evening and fill up my two-gallon gas can. And he says, you give me five bucks, you can have my two gallons of gas in my gas can. So when he got off work, he drove me back to the highway, filled up my car, and I was on my way. I don't think I got into Glendale, California until 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> but what were the chances of me running out of gas right by the Zeke's Unical sign, walking a mile on a dirt road out into the middle of nowhere and finding a refinery where the one guy who's working there happened to fill up his gas can that very evening. That's God's provision. That is not a coincidence. That is not good luck. That Amen. was God bailing me out. Amen. And I am eternally thankful. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, we serve an amazing God, don't we? All right. I hope by now you've turned in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. And let me start by saying just some opening remarks. You know, we live in a world groaning in the pain and agony of physical disease. Some of you deal with chronic pain day after day with little or no relief. And I pray that this sermon will feed your faith as you cry out to God. When Adam sinned, he led the entire human race into the death penalty that God had imposed. From the moment he ate, he died spiritually, and then he began to die physically, although it would come nine centuries later. The Bible also teaches that in Adam, all of his descendants sinned, and through Adam, all of us die as well. Disease is one of the main executioners of the human race. The mortality of the human body was exposed as part of Adam's penalty. In 2016, the University of Michigan Medical School asserted that there were roughly 10,000 disease afflicting human beings with only about 500 known cures and treatments. Among the top diseases, 10 diseases causing the most death worldwide are coronary heart disease, number one, responsible for over 9 million deaths. Stroke, 6.2 million. 
in the year in the year study lower respiratory infections like flu pneumonia bronchitis tuberculosis 3.2 million chronic obstructive pulmonary disease COPD 3.1 million uh, respiratory cancers 1.7 diabetes 1.6 pe million people a year and you know since COVID has run amok around the world people have been more aware of the devastating effects of disease like never before but and here's the good news for a brief moment in human history a man appeared who had absolute complete control over every disease and sickness known to man and that man was Jesus Christ huge crowds thronged around Jesus and the New Testament tells us that he healed all of them Matthew 4 verse 24 it says news about him spread all over Syria and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases those who are suffering severe pain the demon possessed those having seizures and the paralyzed and he healed them Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35 Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness mark chapter 6 and verse 56 and wherever he went into the villages towns and countryside they placed the sick in the marketplaces he begged they begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak and all who touched him were healed now there's never been a healing ministry like that of Jesus however healings have on have answered prayer in every generation and some prayer warriors have seen such healings in their time Jesus alone was the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy Matthew 8 17 and it was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah he took upon himself our infirmities and carried our disease and so today I want to begin to look at the beginning of the healing ministry of Jesus Christ and draw out some lessons for each one of us it began in a synagogue in Capernaum and then in the home of Simon Peter with Simon's mother-in-law and so Jesus's first miracle as we looked at a few weeks ago was in John chapter 2 and 11 when he turned water into wine that means before that miracle which he did at about the age of 30 that he had not done any miracles up until that date but he revealed himself at the wedding feast at the insistence of his mother that they'd run out of wine he revealed himself and the disciples believed and so the context that we're going to be looking at this morning is Jesus was at the synagogue in Capernaum speaking when a demon possessed man cried out Jesus drove the demon out he said in Mark chapter 1 25 and 26 be quiet Jesus said sternly come out of him and the evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek people's reaction obviously was overwhelming Mark chapter 1 verse 27 and all the people were so amazed and they asked each other what is this a new teaching and with authority he even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him news about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee and so he left the synagogue that evening after the Sabbath worship and it says there and as soon as they left the synagogue they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew but there was a cloud that hung over the family at that time these were successful fishermen prosperous enough to own their own home archaeologists believe that they have found Peter's home and they describe it the house had doors and windows that opened to an interior courtyard accessed by a gateway from the street not just a door at the street but a gateway from the street which was the center of the dwellings around it containing hearths millstones for grain hand presses and stairways to the roof of the dwelling the dwellings were constructed of heavy of heavy walls of black balsa balsa is a type of a rock over which flat roof 
of wood and thatch was placed. So this was like a compound that you came in from the street through a gateway and there were a number of homes or number of places uh, around it. Verse 30 says, Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and they told Jesus about her. Now, here's something interesting. Obviously, Peter was married. And in fact, Paul in... uh, 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 5 says, Peter took his wife along him with some of his apostolic preaching missions. And you know, this just tickled me the other day when I read this. Peter's marriage is significant because the church history has the Roman Catholic Church. They teach that Peter was the first pope and that priests should be celibate. I don't know why that tickled me, but it was just quite interesting to think about that that the first pope was actually married. But at this time, there was deep concern about her health. In fact, her life was threatened by the sickness. They told Jesus about her, and so he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up, and the fever left her, and she began to wait on them. Now, think about it. He went into the room where she was lying, took her hand, and she was healed. And Jesus lived the life of a servant, We'll see that again and again, how any need that was ever brought to him, he moves out to go and meet it. We'll also see how often Jesus used physical touch. The fever left her immediately, and she was immediately strengthened. Now, no need for convalescence, no need for chicken soup or two days rest. She felt strength and energy and got up immediately to serve the guests who were there for the afternoon meal. Now, so what is a fever? Now, Mandy, forgive me. (laughs) I'm going to try. What causes the body to raise its temperature? Let me explain from what I read of my uh, understanding. Fever is the body's response to a bacterial or viral infection. And it mobilizes the body's immune system to kill the infectious agents, the bacteria or the virus. The body can handle the higher temperatures better than the infectious agents can. And here's a big fat word that I had to go and find in Google. Google's wonderful sometimes. Uh, the, The hypothalamus, which sits at the base of the brain, regulates the body temperature. Triggered, It is triggered to raise body temperature when the immune system identifies the pathogen. So, pathogen, that's why she had a fever. And I'm not going to go into the rest of it. So, what did Jesus do when he took her by the hand? We saw a miracle happen. Immediately the fever left her. Whenever, whatever infectious agent was causing trouble in the body, may have instantly been destroyed by the power of God. And then it goes on in verse 32 onwards. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and the demon possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Now, let me just give a a testimony. Years ago in South Africa, one of the ministries that we used to do and have was a ministry of deliverance. And oftentimes the demons would want to speak. And obviously what we did was from what Jesus did. We told them to shut up and come out. We're not going to believe what you say because you're a liar anyway, so just come out and get out of here. And that's what happened when we prayed over these people. They just, the demons just left. So let's look at what's going on. The Sabbath began at sunset the night before and ended at sundown that evening. And so the community waited until the end of Sabbath so that his healing ministry began. They brought demon possessed and sick to him. He forbade the demons to speak. The demons, you see, have an accurate theological knowledge and know who Jesus is. But Jesus forbade them to speak. And so what are the 
elements of Jesus' healing ministry. I'm going to give you seven words to describe his healing ministry. Firstly, successful. He never lost a patient. Secondly, universal. There was no disease he couldn't heal. Thirdly, it was effortless. There was no struggle. Nothing was too difficult. Fourthly, it was instantaneous. We already talked about that with the mother-in-law. She was instantly healed, no process. Five, it was personal. Jesus often preferred to touch people one at a time. And there were these records of group feedings, 5,000 and then 4,000 another time, but there is no uh, talk anywhere in the Gospels of group healings. He didn't say, all get up now and I'm going to pray over you and you're all going to be healed. That never happened, one at a time. Uh, six, it was free. I mean financially. Now, I'm not disparaging people who make their money by medical means. I thank God for their training. I mean, I'm here today. Of course, uh, because of Jesus, but also the expert medical treatment I have received. The doctors who care for me are amazing. And if it was 30, 20, maybe even 10 years ago, I would be pushing daisies now. But they, with the power of God, I was healed and continue to be healed. Jesus sent his disciples saying, freely have you received, freely give. The woman with a bleeding problem, Mark 5 and 26, she suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she got worse. And number seven, different approach. It was never the same every time. He didn't get into a pattern and do it the same way. Oh, well, it worked this way this time, therefore I'm going to do it this way, the same as that way this time. For instance, in healing blind people, sometimes he spat and put mud on their man's eyes. Another time he spat directly into a man's eyes and touched him. Another time he just spoke. Different approaches at each time. So the seven elements or characteristics of Jesus' healing ministry. Number one, it was successful. Number two, it was universal. Anybody who came to him. Number three, it was effortless. He didn't say, well, just wait a moment. I'm going to go around to that mountain over there and I'm going to pray for five minutes or ten minutes. Then I'm going to come down and pray for you. So it was effortless. It was instantaneous. It was personal. It was free. And it was varied. So healings are signs pointing to our Savior. The real healing we all need is not primarily physical, but spiritual. And we're going to talk about this in time to come with a paralyzed man whose friends let him down. And Jesus doesn't heal him physically at first, but says to him, your sins are forgiven. That's the priority. Luke 5 verse 31, Jesus answered them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. The ultimate sickness we all face is sin, and the healing is repentance and forgiveness of sins, and Jesus alone can do that atoning work. Jesus' healing ministry signifies human weakness, inability, and powerlessness. Romans 5 says, it says, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. And then it signifies a world to come in which there will be no more death, nor mourning, nor crying, nor pain. The real healing is still to come, and it's called the resurrection. We will have resurrected bodies, and, they will never, and we will never have disease or injury again. You see, again, I was thinking about this. None of those that he healed He didn't say to them after he healed them, now you're going to be well for the rest of your life and when you get old, you know, I'll push a button and you'll come and be with me. None of those healings were a permanent solution to the problem of disease. All those people that he healed died later. I would imagine that some of them might have, I don't know, got injured within a few days or weeks or months or got sick again. We don't know what happened to them after that encounter with Jesus. Death is the final enemy. So any healing 
we get is not permanent. Have you thought about that? 1 Corinthians 15 from verse 55 says, Oh, death, where is your sting? Those of us who know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we're not worried about what happens when we die. We know that we're going to spend eternity with the Lord. Many years ago, remember when that whole Y2K thing was going on? I had some folk who actually left this church and went and, uh, to Oregon near Bend and bought a 120-acre farm. And they said, Peter, there's going to be rioting in the streets. There's going to be chaos in the cities. We do not know if you will survive that time here in Bellevue because you have no idea what's going to be happening in the streets. Why don't you come down to Bend with us we will build you a house and you can pastor us down there. I said to this person, I said, you know, I'm not afraid to die. If that's the way I'm supposed to go, so be it. That's number one. The second thing I need to tell you, that I cannot leave the people behind that God's called me to shepherd during that time. If anything, I'm going to open up the church and invite people to come in and sleep here. And then we'll have Jack at the door with his. <laughs> no, seriously. I said, <laughs> sorry, Jack. But I said, I'm not afraid to die. And so there's no need for me to go anywhere. God's called me to these people, and that's where I will be when they are. Yeah. What about the rest of them? Should we all invite them down to the farm as well? And he said, obviously not. So I said, well, I'm staying. You have your answer. So what does the healings that Jesus did prove about him? Firstly, it shows his compassion. He is a compassionate God, and he cares about our suffering. And I want to promise you here today that he has told us in the word that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. Number two. They show his power. There's nothing he cannot do. He is an omnipotent son of God. Now again, there's many of us who've prayed for things regarding healing, and it hasn't happened. Does it mean that God's forgotten us? No. I don't know the answers, but I do know this, that my God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he doesn't change. And in the midst of our struggle, in the midst of what we might be going through, we can rely on him. And thirdly, ultimately, they show his identity as the son of God. And so how do we connect healing and faith? Frequently, Jesus said, according to your faith, it will be done unto you. With blind Bartimaeus, he said, according to your faith, it will be done, done to you. That's not always. Some people Jesus healed didn't believe at all. The guy in John chapter 5 turned him into the temple police. Just because he was healed, it doesn't mean he was saved. And so what am I saying by that? I'm saying simply this. There is a link between faith and healing. Now, I, maybe I'm going to tread on some toes here, but so what? I do that quite often. I've heard people who've come up for prayer, not in this church because I would never say this, but people have come up for prayer at an evangelistic meeting and et cetera and et cetera, and they've been prayed over and nothing has happened. And then the preacher puts a heavy on the people and says it's because of your faith, because of your lack of faith you weren't healed. Now, let me just say that's absolute garbage. That's absolute nonsense. Okay? Believe, John chapter 14, verse 11. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father's in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. Believe on the evidence of the miracles. It's a valid basis for our faith. 
And so what does miracles do? When people get ill, why do you think we want testimonies here uh, in the front of the church before I start preaching? Because I believe it builds our faith. If God can do it for Don or Cindy or whoever, then, Don, then God can do it for me as well because he's not a respecter of persons. That's what it does. So what I'm saying is believe on the evidence of the miracles. It is a valid basis for our faith. It's totally valid to say, I believe in Jesus, the healer. I believe in Jesus, the wonder worker, the miracle worker. I believe he's the son of God. But there's something that you need to understand. The undergirding power of Jesus' healing ministry was prayer. Everything emanated from prayer. Verse 35, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. This is one of the great verses in the Bible about a daily quiet time. It's a glimpse into Jesus' private spiritual life. He relied on prayer. He yearned for a time with his father. It guided and gave him power. I never met anyone, though, who has expressed complete satisfaction with their prayer life. Are you completely satisfied with your prayer life this morning? I don't think any one of us could say, man, you know, every single day for the last 20 years, every day I've had this amazing prayer ministry, prayer, prayer life. We all yearn for more of that. We all hunger for more of that. Jesus shed his blood on the cross as an atoning sacrifice for our sin so that through faith in his blood, all our sins may be forgiven. And generally, our prayers are weak. That was a central ministry that, that he came to do. He came that our sins might be forgiven. But how did he do that? 2 Peter, 1 Peter 2 verse 21 says, Christ left you an example that you should follow. I want to get my mind, my brain, my heart, my body ready at the beginning of the day and then go off with God's plan. And that was Jesus' pattern. He's saying to you and I this morning, get everything in alignment with him and then go and face the day. Don't let the world steal from you the time you can have with the Lord. I read a story a number of years ago I never forgot. It's about a man who used to get up regularly at 4 o'clock in the morning and for prayer time for a number of hours. I'm not advocating or saying, but this young man came to him and said, how do you do it? And he said, I'm going to tell you the secret, young man. Young man, get up. Because how many of you have decided that well, you know, it's kind of wintry and I'm going to lie in bed. I wake up and I'm going to pray. And two minutes later, <laughs> you're snoring again. The secret is, young man, I get up. Imagine this particular day with Jesus. He'd had the Sabbath. He'd been in the synagogue the whole day uh, ministering. He'd cast out a demon out of this guy. And then the next morning, what did he do? He got up early and he went to pray. He left Peter's house and he went to pray. And so I believe Jesus got his marching orders from the Father every single day. And so Jesus, so as Jesus just walked perfectly in the good works the Father had prepared in advance for him, and that explains the mystery to me. Why could he do the healings he did? Why could he minister like he did? Why could he do what he did in those brief three and a half years here on earth? It's because he had communion with his father every single day. But at the same time, he didn't mind being interrupted. Didn't matter who interrupted him. A woman, a child, groups of people. Jesus is available to all. Those interruptions were part of his plan. And so the Father told Jesus what to speak. John 8, 28. 
but I don't do, say anything. I do nothing of my own, but I speak just what the Father taught me. And so, how do you think this happened? It happened because early in the morning, he used to get up and go and spend time with his heavenly Father. He's getting ready for his day of ministry, his teaching ministry, and hearing from the Father about what to say and do. And Acts chapter 10, 38 says that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. God was with him through the Holy Spirit. And just as Jesus did nothing apart from the will of the Father, he, but also did no miracles or teaching apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. So what about us? What about you and I? If a sinless Jesus needed quiet time every day with the Father, how much more do we need? Are you meeting with the Lord on a daily basis? But then there's one other thing, and I'll close in a few minutes. Uh, verse 36 and 37, Simon and his companions went looking for him. When they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Hey, Jesus, what are you doing? There's a whole bunch of people at my house there. Why aren't you down there ministering to the people? But you see, he didn't come to meet the physical needs and heal them day after day, but he came to preach the word. Verse 38, 39. Let's go somewhere else. He didn't even go back there. He said, let's go somewhere else to the nearby villages so that I can preach there, there also. Underline preach there also. That's why I've come. He came to preach the word of God. The entrance of his word brings light to you and I. So he traveled through Galilee, preaching in their synagogue and driving out demons. Preaching was the key to everything and the priority. So here's the steps. He gets up early in the morning and he spends time with the Father. Then he goes and does his ministry and the key aspect of his ministry is the preaching of his word. And as he preaches the word, then he goes and heals them. Why is that? Because our souls need salvation, and salvation comes by hearing and believing the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And it's my prayer every Sunday that I get up here, that Gabby and I get up here, that the entrance of his word brings light to you, that faith will be rising in you and you will believe God for miracles. You will believe God for your families. You will believe God for those in your community. He had a ministry to move out and preach the gospel to everyone. And so, what is the application? I've hit hard about the quiet time, but if you had a chance to meet tomorrow with the Almighty God in prayer time, in which he assures you of his love and then tells you what good works he has in store for you that day, how can you miss that? So, with Lent coming, let's begin some new patterns. The core element of Jesus' ministry was prayer, preaching, and healing. And so, I beg of you this morning, each of you who are hearing me today, be certain that your sins are forgiven through faith in Jesus Christ. Do you remember what I mentioned last week about Simon Peter when Jesus asked his disciples who, they, who men thought he was? What did he say? He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. But then what happens is, Peter takes him aside. He has this inspiration from God, and he says, you're the Christ. Then he pulls Jesus aside, and he says, Jesus, he rebukes Jesus. Now, can I say something simple? God doesn't need your input. He doesn't need your advice. God is God, and you and I need to accept what he says to us. I know he is the son of God. But you know, we don't have one millionth understanding of that really, do we? We have maybe pictures in our mind of who Jesus might be, who God might be. We might have 
images in our mind of, of heaven. But you know, I don't believe we have one millionth percent of understanding that. So what I encourage you to do as we're going through this, the miracle series, I encourage you, saturate your minds with these accounts. Expand your sense of the greatness of Christ and trust in Him. And He will bring it to pass in your life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so if you're here this morning and you need him to meet you at whatever point of need, I want you quietly, before all comes to play, I want you quietly just to speak to God. He is the Son of God. He is present right here in this place right now. And so the question that I leave you with is there on the screen. Do you believe? Do you believe? Do you believe that I'm able to do this? Maybe you're facing something regarding healing in your life. And you've prayed, and you've prayed, and you've prayed, and you haven't seen anything dramatic happen. Do you know what? He's still a miracle-working God. Maybe you've got issues in, in relation to family, and you've prayed, and you've prayed, and you've prayed. But how many of our prayers, when we've prayed, are the moment prayers? We've never spent time with God in His Word. We've never sought His face. We just kind of prayed because there's this crisis and then we get on with the rest of our lives my plea to you this morning is seek him and he will be found and so father we thank you for the things you learned today in the gospel of mark it's really amazing there's so many things to learn we thank you for jesus healing ministry it was powerful it was universal it was unique and effortless do you know the real healing that he needs to do in all of us is a healing from sin and so Lord work in us an ongoing deep work of repentance turn us away from wickedness and sin turn us to purity and holiness that we might live a life worthy of the Lord and might bring glory to your name while we live in this world, in Jesus' name. And Father, I pray for each person here this morning. I pray for those that have cried out to you in the midnight hour, the morning hours, regarding a friend, regarding a relative, regarding a son or a daughter. Father, I pray that you would meet them at that point of need, Minister to them by your spirit. Father, may they grow in confidence in you and your word. Father, may they grow in an understanding of who you are and what you can do in each one of those lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.